Hello and welcome to the Admin Bar episode number 12 where we are talking about building accessible websites. I am Kyle Van Dusen along with my co-host Matt Siebert and our special guest today is Heather Gray. So we want to welcome her to the show and thank her for being here. So Matt, first off, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing great. I've got some struggles with uh, with a client that's got outside hosting that I'm not super happy with, but otherwise things are things are good. Well, just be glad you're doing this instead of doing that right at the moment. This is true. And Heather, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing great. Awesome. Uh, so we'll we'll get you uh, get you to properly introduce yourself here in just a few. But I do want to kind of set up a little bit about the topic at hand today. So um, I know you know we're talking about accessibility standards and websites, and this isn't going to be the type of show that is or the 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 episode that we're going to be walking through all the all the guidelines and giving you point by point instructions. It's a huge topic. Um, you know, it's something that you can do a ton of research and uh, always get better at. And Heather did an awesome job of providing us a bunch of uh, resources that we're going to pass along to you. They'll be all in the show notes. Um, so you can go and test websites that you have, learn more about some of the accessibility standards uh, and, and kind of level up your game in that. So I, I definitely want to say that our idea to do this show came out of my complete ignorance to the topic. So, um, you know, I just don't know a whole lot about accessibility standards and I don't, I'm not going to pretend on this show that I know a whole lot about it, but I do think it's something that's important. So I do think as human beings in general, we we're kind of self-serving most of the time. I, I almost want to use the word selfish, you know, so it's, it's hard for us to go out of our way to do something that only benefits someone else. Not because we're bad people or we don't want to, but it's kind of our human nature to look after ourselves, you know? So I think that's one of these things where the accessibility conversation doesn't happen a lot in all the groups that we're in. Um, you know, every once in a while, somebody will post a website and somebody will comment, you know, you know, this, this certain thing isn't great for accessibility or something. But other than that, I don't see a lot of, um, you know, conversation going on about this topic. So what what my hope is, is that we can kind of look at this topic in a different light and show you that really building websites that are more accessible is extremely beneficial to you as well. So um, recently I was just introduced to the term universal design. So um, I'm going to read off the definition here because I think it's kind of important for those that aren't familiar with it. I might be the only one, but I thought this was a good definition. So it says universal design is the design and composition of an environment so that it can be accessed, understood, and used to the greatest extent of, of by, or extent possible by all people, regardless of their age, size, ability, or disability. An environment or any building product or service in that environment should be designed to meet the needs of all people who wish to use it. This is not a special requirement for the benefit of only a minority of the population. It is a fundamental condition of good design. If an environment is accessible, usable, convenient, and a pleasure to use, everyone benefits. By considering the diverse needs and abilities of all throughout the design process, universal design creates products, services, and environments that meet people's needs. Simply put, universal design is good design. So I was actually introduced to this um, this phrase through a show that I saw our uh, 60 minutes uh, segment they did on Sunday night. So I did several posts about it, uh, kind of different angles about it, but so I won't go into the whole thing, but essentially a architect um, had a brain tumor. They did surgery. He lost his vision, uh, but continued being an architect. And what he ended up doing was uh, designing buildings for people who had vision impairments um, because he was now an expert in that field. So, um, they were showing part of the story was they were showing he's working on this big uh, transit facility in San Francisco, I believe. And so one of the things they showed he did was uh, there was, you know, it's a big, long facility uh, and there's platforms, you know, every so many feet or whatever. Well, what he did was design it to where the concrete is smooth uh, until you need to turn to go to one of the platforms and then the concrete has texture to it. So when uh, somebody who's using a cane can is, is you know, uh, kind of scraping it across the ground, they can hear that difference and know that this is a place to turn. So what's interesting about that is it still looked really great. And I think you could even pick up some of those cues visually, even if it's subconsciously to know, like, these are all the places where I could turn, you know? So that's kind of an example of something being universally good. Um, 
Heather sent me a video and in the video, the lady who was blind talked about um, automatic doors, you know, so you're carrying a bunch of groceries out of the grocery store and you can't grab the door. Well, they have the automatic doors that open. That's good for everyone. And it's great for people uh, who might be in a wheelchair. So a lot of these examples talk about like uh, the physical world, but I think they're easily translatable into digital spaces as well. So an example that I thought of was, uh, you know, adding alt tags to your images. So for somebody using a screen recorder, um, that's going to explain what that image is to them. But it's universally good because that's also going to explain to Google what your image is. So now you're going to have better SEO benefits from the alt tags. Uh, the same thing could go for subtitles to videos. So somebody that is deaf could watch the video and still understand everything that's, that's being talked about. But also you have a ton of people who watch videos on silent anyways, or you can take that text and turn it into a blog post and get SEO benefit out of that. So it's something that can be um, universally uh, good for you. And my last point before I shut up and let our guests talk is, you know, I, one thing I really love about WordPress is it seems to be such a positive and inclusive community. And I think this is another way we as the WordPress community can strive to be more inclusive um, for people of all abilities. And it's something that is definitely at our fingertips and we can do something about. So all of that out of the way, uh, Heather, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself so people can get to know you a little bit and kind of your background and why we brought you on uh, to talk about this subject. Okay, um, nice to be on today. Uh, my, uh, I work in um, Guelph, Ontario, which is about an hour northwest of Toronto in Canada. And I uh, do custom themes and some plugins for um, WordPress uh, for um, sort of freelance for clients. Um, I've taken some um, workshop style courses on accessibility and done a lot of my own personal research and I also when I'm building um, custom themes for clients I will try to make it as accessible as possible so um, and some of my clients actually have requirements in terms of accessibility so it's something that I work with quite a lot um, so that's me <laughs> awesome <laughs> well, we're, we're definitely glad to have you here. Um, so let's get to some questions. So um, like I said, I don't want to go through all of the requirements that are there, but I do want to yeah. kind of touch on some of the topics for people. So in your opinion, Heather, can you tell us why these accessibility standards uh, that exist, why those are important? Um, well, a few reasons, like one reason is sort of along the lines of what you were saying, but I, I think a lot of people have a tendency to um, consider themselves the, the uh, sorry, consider their own abilities the standard um, or the average. And so when they're building a site, they're usually thinking about um, how it looks to them and, and how they're personally experiencing their website. And the trouble is that in today, in these times, um, there are so many different experiences everyone's having, even if you just consider um, the different operating systems, the different devices people are using um, in different parts of the world, their ability to access the internet is different. Um, and also your own personal experience is your own personal experience at this moment. So you, your future self may have um, accessibility issues, even if it's temporary, for example, um, even walking inside after being outside on a bright sunny day, you're going to have trouble seeing your screen um, as your eyes take time to adjust. But also if you've been in an accident or you have any kind of um, illness or anything like that, you can come across some accessibility challenges. Um, and that's your own self. Also, as you age, things like your eyesight might um, struggle or, or things like that. So I think that it's really important for everyone to think about um, all the ways in which it would be helpful to try to navigate the internet um, and um, how other people might have issues um, trying to navigate a website because you never know, like you never know um, how somebody, what the experience is of even the person next door to you. So. Yeah, it's true. And I had a client um, not too long ago, I think it was like last year, who um, they required accessibility on their site. And I started to dig mm -hmm. into it. And it was, 
I mean, it was it was pretty overwhelming. Um, like all of the different like aspects that I would never have thought about. Like um, one of them that that really stuck out to me was uh, the ability to navigate a uh, a website purely using your keyboard. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and and that's again like something that you know I would never have thought of. But once you know you start reading about it, you're like, yeah, that that totally makes sense. You know, there's there's a good portion of the population that that's that's how they they navigate you know and being able to do that and and it's like once you know the rules or you know you know that like how to implement these types of things like it's really not that much more work but it does mm -hmm. you know your end result is the website looks and functions the same but functions better actually mm -hmm. you know and it functions better for a lot of a lot more people so yeah it's 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 really interesting for sure a lot of times i like to think about how um, something like keyboard navigation would help me personally, because that also helps me, um, you know, feel eager to make the designs work. So mm -hmm. um, I, I actually find that I use keyboard navigation myself quite a lot, especially if I'm already typing and filling out a form on a website, for example. Sure. Yeah. It's a lot easier to just tap to the next form field exactly. than it is to go back to the mouse. And um, you know, also never know if your mouse or trackpad's going to break mm -hmm. or I mean, I go through them quite a lot, so <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's pretty nice to then also have keyboard navigation when you really need it because yeah. it's helpful um, just for everyone, I think. So, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Uh, so, do you think you know, like Matt brought up, that there was some things in the brief that he got on that project that he would have never thought of? So, I think that's a pretty common condition for most of us is that we're probably just ignorant to the things uh, um, that might be within accessibility standards. So are there some some examples of things you could give us um, that people who have different abilities might have trouble accessing a typical website uh, you would find on the internet? Um, okay, so well, I guess some simple things would be, for example, um, I, the easiest thing I think to check is contrast. I think it's pretty easy. There's some really quick tools to check your color contrast, and it makes a big difference because um, uh, things like um, it, it can help people who have vision impairments, but also even people who are aging, who eyesight is going. But also, just um, sometimes I've noticed low contrast is pretty common in situations where you might have text over a photo, um, and a lot of times it's um, used to be more of an issue with things like hero images or um, image sliders, right? So if you have um, just text and, and it's um, maybe you've created this theme that has a slider and then you pass it off to your client who is then going to be adding the content, you might not always be aware of what the contrast is going to be. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, compensating, finding ways to compensate for that, like putting in a black overlay that's transparent a little bit to darken the images if you're not sure what the image is going to be, for example, it might be a way to help bring out the contrast in the text. Um, but also, but just making sure you're checking, also making sure that you're not using mi sort of mid-tones for backgrounds of text, because I, th I think that's also a common place, especially on buttons or places where you're just adding a little bit of um, a, a color highlight or something on your page try to make sure that contrast is still there because it really makes a big difference for a lot of people, I think. Mm -hmm. um, another thing is, um, yeah, definitely keyboard navigation is a big thing. Like it's easy to check, just try navigating your site with your keyboard. Um, and it's a quick fix. And I actually think it will make your code cleaner and, and better. Um, making sure that your uh, structure of your page is well set up. Um, that will help, I believe, also helps SEO. Um, it helps Googlebot navigate your site if your structure is clean. So a few things to look up for are that your headings don't skip any levels. So you have an H1, and then below that you'll have H2, and below that you have H3, and you don't just use, for example, an H4 because you have some good styles Right. Connected mm -hmm. with the H4 and, and you're just going to throw it in to make your text look nice. You can just give it a class name or something for that. Or with um, page builders, that makes it super easy. You can just tag it whatever H you need and then change all the text however you need it. So Yeah, exactly. So, um, uh, yeah. So, uh, 
I think those are maybe some of the really simpler ones, simpler um, things you can do. Uh, and I think all the all those ones that you illustrate are also just good principles of design in general. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I know I've had uh, I think maybe maybe the reason this this first entered my head as a topic for this is I had shared a website and somebody said that it did well on such and such test, you know, and it wasn't something that I like sought out to do. Um, mm -hmm. It was just the way I designed it. You know, I've uh, been designing for a long time. So, you know, I've learned a thing or two about making sure things contrast and, you know, kind of the things mm -hmm. you said. Um, so I think part of, part of what you're saying really wraps into kind of the whole intro to this is, all those things you just mentioned are just good design principles anyways. The mm -hmm. site structure of your website for SEO purposes, you want to do that anyway. So now you have mm -hmm. two reasons to make sure before you publish that website that you've structured it properly, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I think those are always good things to keep in mind. We did just get a question from uh, John Stanton, and I would like to uh, ask you this to see if you have kind of uh, any insight on this. He said, how do uh, how does Elementor rank in from an ex accessibility perspective? So I would say, you know, any kind of page builder are there are there anything any parts of a page builder that make uh, accessibility more difficult um, it, there can be and I, it depends on the specific page builder and unfortunately I don't use Elementor so I can't um, comment specifically on that but um, I I think the thing is um, I've noticed sometimes with page builders with plugins it really depends on the individual um, one that you choose but the the, pro the issue with accessibility is that um, every part of website development uh, is can be a can affect accessibility so even if you've built a beautiful site and you're passing it off to a client to enter content there are elements of that as for example entering alt tags on images that your client will then have to maintain making sure that things like links don't just say click here um, i have a client that's notorious for that. <laughs> um, but, and, and so things like that. Um, so, and that's going to be up to whoever ends up maintaining the site and, and entering content. And so even if, you know, you've checked your site, I, I think a good thing to, I mean, really what you'll need to do is um, create your site and then audit it and, you know, check it out. Even if the, the code that the builder puts out might be fine, but there's still going to be quite a bit up to you depending on, like for example, like contrast is another good example that has, you know, um, is even outside of whatever code the builder's gonna put out. Mm -hmm. I, I think with page builders, the thing is that um, d checking keyboard navigation, cause that's a big issue that comes up with any plugin or um, checking that the, I don't know if Elementor has the ability to create forms or if you use like yeah they do okay so um, if if that's the case you also have to check that the forms are accessible um, uh, so I, I like it you'd have to go through and, and check even if you know you used it for one site and that site becomes accessible you may need to um, it may not be for the next one so um, but yeah, I'm sorry I can't comment specifically on Elementor. No, 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 you're fine. I think that that kind of goes to the same thing for you know themes. I think a lot of people that are using page builders. There's there's three or four themes that a lot of those people are are using. So uh, as far I, I'm pretty sure you said in your little intro that you actually build themes. But uh, some of the popular themes are you familiar with things like Generate Press or Astra or uh, Ocean WP? Do you have any familiarity with those or how their accessibility might be? Um, I don't personally use them, so that's the issue. Like, I have yeah. heard of them. And so I think, I, I know I've been through, um, gosh, uh, you know, I have audited some themes, that, but not those ones specifically. But sure. I think the main things that I come across when I see themes um, that I've audited that are built by a third party are that the a lot of times the menu isn't keyboard navigable. So you know, that's a good thing to check. Um, sometimes issues can be things that you can edit. So even if it, you know, maybe doesn't have enough contrast, you can usually change that with a lot of page builders or, or sure. some themes will give you that control. So um, you can 
probably check that out. But the other thing to check is um, IDs. That's something I've come across with a few themes are that they don't have unique IDs on some of the elements. So that can be a problem. Um, also to check that as you're using your keyboard navigation, that you can see where you are as you're navigating through. So if you hit tab on your keyboard, it will allow you to skip through the different links and different form fields on the page. Um, but a lot of times a theme will lose focus, so you won't actually know what you're selected on as you're going through your site. And that's a problem if that's how you're navigating your site and you, you there's no way that it's highlighted or showing up in any way um, right. hmm. where the focus is. So uh, that's an important thing to look at if you're auditing. I know you, you brought up the point of, you know, going through and auditing your website for accessibility. And, and like mm -hmm. I said, I know you gave us a bunch of links and I'll post all those so people can do some of that work and, um, and check the sites they've built. I can say from experience, while I haven't done any accessibility audits on my um, on my websites, what I have spent a lot of time doing is SEO audits, uh, kind of from like the technical SEO standpoint. And what I've learned is that um, by building a site, then going and looking at it uh, and seeing all the technical errors, the things I messed up, going back and having to fix it. Well, the next time I don't, I don't make those same mistakes again. And as I kind of do that over and over, uh, now when I get finished building a site and run those audits, uh, my websites are a lot, I have a lot less errors or problems with them. So I'm sure it works the same way. Just the more you have to focus on some of those accessibility things, the better off you'll just do that by default. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Andy did comment in here. He yeah, said, uh, you, you, will you read that one, Matt? Um, well, it's a, it's a long one. You want me to read, read the whole thing? Um, I, well, Might if you well. read it. All right. So Andy says, um, I know a lot of people on here either use uh, Generate Press, Astra, or Ocean WP. And while I don't use, uh, or I don't know much about Astra or Ocean WP, I do know that Generate Press is fully accessible out, out of the box. It follows WCAG 2.0 standards. It's uh, it has screen reader elements, and Chris Costello just joined and knocked me up. So I can... <laughs> uh, let's uh, scroll back to that. So it follows WCAG 2.0 standards. It has screen reader elements, and everything can be navigated using the tab key and your keyboard, etc. It also has built-in schema.org structured data, which is a big help to those search engine. Uh, engines and assistive technologies like screen readers to understand what elements are on a page. Where things go awry is when you add page builders into the mix. Sure. Smile and if I was going to have to guess on any of those, I would have guessed uh, Generate Press has already gotten all that taken care of. Now, some of the other ones might too. And, it, and it, if we get some comments on that later, um, I know some representatives from some of those themes are part of the group, so they can chime in on here and we can mm -hmm. make sure to uh, clear the record on that because I don't want I don't want anybody to take away that I said their, uh, their themes were not accessible if they are. Just a question I have. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we did go over kind of some of the, the easy steps we can take as far as uh, beginning to design more accessible websites. Um, you know, we mentioned things like like alt tags and, and even being able to check uh, if you can navigate through the site uh, with your tab key. Do you have any more of those kind of little tips for us or should we move on to the next topic? I mean, there's so many. <laughs> yeah. um, so I've, People uh, love tips. Yeah, yeah. There's just... Um, is just trying to think of which ones are simpler, I think is the, a bit of a challenge. Like the, um, I don't, those might be the, the main ones that are straightforward. I mean, obviously there, there is a trick with the alt tags though, um, because I, I think um, one thing to be careful of is that you're not, um, I, I, a lot of times people might have that misconception that when you have a photo on a website, you enter what's in the photo in the alt tag. And although that's the case for most of the time, sometimes that's not um, the best way to do it if for in terms of accessibility, sorry. So um, if, for example, your photo is a link to another page, you, what you want to have in the alt tag is the title of the page, not what the content of the photo is. Mm. Um, also, if your image is purely visual, like the, the whole point of it is just to um, help the design of your site. Maybe it's just a little um, a PNG or sprite or something um, and right. doesn't have any textual or, or 
informative content in it, then um, it's best to still have an alt tag but leave it blank because that way a screen reader will know, okay, the alt tag is meant to be there, but it's blank. So that tells the screen reader that actually this is just a visual um, design feature and not actually something that has to do with the content. Okay, yeah, that's super interesting. I think going, I'll always, I have this bad habit of not add, adding my alt tags until the project's about ready to publish. And then I'm like, oh, I don't want to go through and add all these, you know, 500 alt tags to this uh, project. And what I usually end up doing is trying to kind of do the alt tags for the SEO value, you know, so I'm, I'm more trying to tag keywords in there than I am really describing what's in the picture. But that's, that's a good point of, um, you know, if it's, if the picture is the link, uh, obviously, that needs to be made clear through the screen reader. That's a good point and something I wouldn't have thought of either. So let me ask you this. What do you think, um, you know, one of the last points I made in my little opening thing was talking about, um, you know, the WordPress community and, and how much I think we all kind of love it. Um, but what do you think our responsibility as designers and developers are to be more proactive about making accessible websites? Um, you know, the, the, there, there's going to be some projects where we get where that's part of the brief and that's something we have to do. Um, there's also going to be like, you know, taking these extra steps to see if I can tab through everything on my website or, or uh, looking at some of those things, running some of those audits on there. So what do you think it, what do you think our responsibility is for making sure we, we take the extra few minutes and do things like that? Um, well, the thing is, the more accessible your website is, the more people who will be able to use it and who will want to visit your site. So I, although um, the other issue is that there, there, in a lot of countries, there are actually legal requirements. So, um, and I know in the province I live in, there by um, 20... 21, I believe, I might be wrong, but very soon anyway, um, they're going to be expanding it, the, the laws to include all websites, um, all public websites will need to have to follow accessibility guidelines, I think up to WK uh, level two, level AA. Um, so I, I think um, it's, it's tricky to say because it depends a little bit on what are the laws in your area. But even outside of that, the fact is that the, the more you do, the easier it will be for people to navigate your site and the easier it will be for Googlebot to navigate your site. And um, so I feel like it's just a good plan anyway. Um, and, like the, and really just trying to do as much as you can because I, I know it's a, there's a lot to take in, especially if you're new to the concept and new at first. There are a lot of guidelines and a lot to look at and auditing sites that where you haven't considered accessibility um, sometimes can be pretty overwhelming. Um, but it's a good way to get familiar with the concepts and to get to know what the best practices are because like you said, you know, the next time you do a site, all of that will be in your head and it will be a lot more accessible and the auditing process will be a lot easier, so. Yeah, it's true. Um, I mean, that, that site that I mentioned earlier, um, I had a couple of people on here ask, you know, if I ended up doing it. Um, for other reasons, I, I, uh, I didn't. <clears throat> Their budget just wasn't there. Like, you know, there's a couple of different reasons. But, um, you know, when I did look into the that, that like official booklet of this is this is all the the, the pieces and bits that you need to uh, to account for. I mean, I printed it out so that I could read it on my own time, wherever and whenever. And um, I mean, we're talking it was it was almost an inch thick, and mm -hmm. you know it's there's a lot of information. And granted, the uh, this particular PDF that I found um, it was like it was a, a an official one, I believe. Um, they do a phenomenal job and one of the reasons that it is so thick is that it's all explained it's like this is how you do it this is these are you know examples these are you know these are examples of how not to do it um so you know if it is something that you're interested in in taking taking a look at and like learning more about i mean there's a lot of information and it's very good information out there 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and John just asked, what is the best tool to test how accessible a website is? If you have anything off the top of your head that you'd want to share, uh, we can do that. I know, John, just to let you know, Heather did when we first booked this, she sent me an email with a ton of uh, links and kind of uh, categorizing all those. So once we get this published on our website and on YouTube, I'll make sure to include all those links for you um, so you can have all those. But is there any uh, tools off the top of your head that you think people should take a look at, Heather? Oh, for sure. Um, so the one thing is using one tool, you're never going to catch everything. So if that's important to you, catching everything, you'll need to use multiple tools. But for the general bulk of most of the, the issues, I would look at Axe, which is a um, pl- an extension you can get for Chrome and I believe also Firefox. Um, and you can just install it and then open your DOM inspector. Um, which is like, you, you know, if you just right click and go to inspect elements, if you're not used to doing that. Sure. Um, and then it'll be one of the options across the, the top. You just click on X and it um, and run, click analyze and it will show you a lot of the errors. And it's just a great one. It's really comprehensive. It will take you through all the errors it finds and also explain um, in the, in, you can also look at, read the actual guidelines to see um, and learn more about what the guidelines actually say and why it's an issue and all those things. So um, I quite like that one. And tell me the name of it again or spell it for me. I didn't quite catch it. It's Axe, so just A-X-E. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think maybe it's your Canadian accent in my Texas ears and I just- (laughs) No problem. (laughs) Matt probably understood you. He's from up north, so it was was probably with you. Well, awesome. Well, I'll make sure to get uh, links to everything definitely in the show notes. So, Matt, do you have any other questions you want to ask uh, before we kind of get to the wrap up portion of this? Um, not a question, but uh, let's see. Colleen did mention that uh, in the U.S., generally anything federally federally funded or produced by the government has to be accessible, which totally makes sense. Um, so, you know, even even if you're not working on projects that need to be accessible at this time. You know, it's it's a it's a really good thing to have, you know, at least some experience or some knowledge in, so that if you do get one of these, you know, like larger larger sites, larger clients, you can fairly uh, confidently say, yeah, you know, maybe I haven't done it in the past, but I know of it, and I you know I have a fairly good grasp. So you know, just learning it could potentially you know allow you to uh, to gain better clients. Who knows? Yeah, absolutely. Anytime you can broaden your skills, that's always a good thing. So here's just like another opportunity for you to grow as a designer and developer. And, you know, like we talked about, so many of these things uh, might be in the rule books for accessibility, but they're also just good parts of design. So I know we have quite a few people in the group that are, you know, have been developing websites for a long time and don't have a lot of design experience. Well, uh, I, I would venture to guess without having read things uh, in some of the guidelines, you know, some of the rules they have on contrast are rules that are just going to be good for design anyway. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, there's certainly no harm in learning uh, some new skills. And, uh, you know, like, like Matt said, you might be able to win some better projects because um, you're more familiar with this. So even mm-hmm. if it is uh, in the end self-serving, it's still a good thing no matter what. So, well, Heather, I definitely appreciate you joining us and giving us some, insight on this. Like I said, I I came at this from complete ignorance. So hopefully I didn't make a complete fool of myself or Matt. Um, (laughs) But we we appreciate you coming on and and shedding some light on this for us. So I want to give you some time if there's anything you'd like to promote, promote, or if there's uh, any way people can find you online and you'd like to connect with them, uh, definitely tell us about it. Okay, um, you can visit my website at treadlightly.ca. Or also follow me on Twitter if you like at treadlightly. That'd awesome. Perfect. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll include those in the show notes as well. So everybody can uh-huh. connect with you and, and uh, reach out to Heather and thank her for uh, being a guest on the show because we appreciate it. Oh, uh, somebody, did, somebody did ask me the other day, uh, how much we pay to have guests on here. And oh. Like, oh, don't start telling people we're paying to have guests. <laughs> on. We're going to be out of business really quickly. <laughs> so, Uh, Thank yous go a long way. So everybody, uh, thank Heather for coming on today. Uh, We do have a little bit of housekeeping here uh, before we cut off this show. Um, 
definitely if you are watching the stream and you found us through uh, Facebook or some other uh, external source, we do have a private Facebook community with about 750-ish members uh, where we kind of continue these types of conversations and have all kinds of things going on. So if you're not part of that, you can go to the adminbar.com forward slash group and me or Matt will let you in. Uh, I mentioned the adminbar.com. We have a uh, Pretty much everything we've ever done is listed on the website and all organized for you. In fact, I just went through and redid. Uh, we have uh, some episodes called Bar Talks that are kind of private group only conversations. I did go ahead and archive all those on our website so you can go through everything we've kind of done, but you'll have to be a member of our group. Uh, those uh, those go, you know, for the people that don't know, like those those get into the, the more meat and potatoes type thing. Like you talk pricing, you talk like maybe specific uh, clients and, and things that are, are quite private as far as uh, being in the group. So it's, uh, yeah. it's really, it's worth, it's worth joining for. Yeah. We've had, we've had some really good talks on there. And the reason they're private is because uh, you know, me and Matt both have customers uh, that there's some conversations we don't want to have with our customers. So those ones we try to keep behind a little bit of a gate, uh, but we've had, we had two fantastic ones last week, uh, um, that you should definitely go check out. And of course, if you want to listen to us on the go, all this comes out as a podcast. Um, one more thing we are actually working on. I did a post earlier, maybe this weekend about, um, doing a, um, a giveaway of a lead magnet that I've been using on my website. So I've completely uh, unbranded this lead magnet to get rid of all my branding on it. And it's something we're going to be giving away probably towards the end of this week or early next week. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, I think we're going to have a little bit of an ability to for some some select people for me to actually go through and rebrand it for them for their brand. So if that's something you're interested in, you could actually have a copy with all your branding on it. So um, next week, we are going to be talking uh, with Roby Lawrence about co-working spaces, and he is in Australia. So I know we've had several people uh, complain to us that it's like 2 a.m. in the morning when we do this show in Australia. So next week, the show is going to be at like 530 Eastern time here in uh, North America. Um, so it'll be early in the morning on Wednesday for the folks in Australia. So y'all have a chance to come on uh, the live stream and check it out. So anyways, Matt, you got anything to add? I think I said my piece. Okay. Well, Heather, again, thank you so much for joining us. And we appreciate uh, appreciate you being part of our conversation. And I'm sure people have more questions in the group. So if you find a few extra minutes and want to want to hop on there, we'd, we'd appreciate that too. So anyways, we'll, we'll uh, talk to y'all next week. Bye.